you. I'm happy to be here uh, to be sort of the lead-off hitter for, uh, for Sundays at CTU. Um, just like with all lead-off hitters, I, I bring the strengths and the weaknesses of the position. So you can, and you can figure out which one is which. Uh, when Father Don and Annie first talked to me well over a year ago about uh, doing a session for Sundays at CTU uh, and wanted me to do something on marriage, uh, it was kind of a neutral subject. <laughs> and so uh, that was the way it was, it was sort of envisioned, is sort of this, this neutral subject that, uh, that I was going to present. It seems like it, the interest has kind of ramped up a little bit uh, especially in the last, uh, the last year, the last six months. And so uh, what I'm going to be doing is talking to you about the, what the church sees as the foundations of marriage, and then perhaps in uh, questions afterwards, we can talk about how to, what that means and what the implications of that are. And so I'd just like to start with with the basic sort of underpinnings about marriage, of where the church gets its teaching on marriage, and then we can talk about uh, the history of it and what possible developments are, are there for, for the future. And so uh, what I'd like to do is first start about the, where the church gets its teaching on marriage. And uh, it comes from the t same two sources that we have for just about everything in the church. It comes from scripture and from tradition. Uh, it comes from reflection on scripture, not that the scriptures contain any proof texts about marriage, but they, they provided sort of the fodder for theologians to reflect upon what marriage is through the revealed word of God. And then the tradition, which talks about how uh, that teaching sort of interacts or intersects with the culture, how the culture has continued to define what marriage was or how marriage took place within the history of the church. And so there's always this sort of uh, dialogue that goes on. And theologians will think about it and write about it and talk about it, but they also are thinking and writing and talking about the culture in which they live. And so it's both historical and theological. Things happened in marriage as a result of history just as much as they did as a result of theology. And so I'd like to start with those, those two things of, uh, of scripture and tradition. And again, where did the church uh, get its understanding of marriage? It was from reflecting, first of all, on the word of God. And so when you talk about the, the word of God, what does, this, what does the word of God have to say about marriage? You don't have to go very far uh, before you encounter it. It's right there from the beginning in the, in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. And that's an important thing because it reminds us that marriage is always rooted in humanity. You know? And that's the thing that, uh, that's why the church has always had this, this uh, sense that we can't do too much with marriage because it's a human reality. It's part of being human. It's the old, in a sense, it's the oldest sacrament that we have because it existed from the beginning. So it predates the beginning of the church, it predates the people of Israel, it goes all the way back to the beginning. And so we're talking about things that happened through creation. And of course, not as, again, as proof texts, but as the church reflecting upon what, is, what do we have here in the word of God. And what you see when you look at those, uh, those stories of creation in the book of Genesis you see a number of things that the church would teach about marriage. That first of all, marriage, in addition to being 
you know, a human reality is also a sacred reality because it was created by God. And so it has its genesis in God's saving action in the world. And that that's the first thing, that, that marriage is, uh, is a sacred reality and not merely a human reality. And so it's not something that, that society dreamed up because it was a convenient thing, but it was something that was part and parcel of creation. And so that's the first thing. The other thing that you see in the stories of creation is the equality of husband and wife. Uh, that they were, that in, in the story, in one of the stories of creation, you have uh, God bringing all the parts of creation before the man to see what he would call them, and, and the man gave names to all the, the, the animals of the world. It says, but none proved to be the suitable or the equal partner to the man. All of the other things were subordinate. And so God went back to work and created woman so that creation then would be complete. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one is my equal. And so you have the equality of husband and wife, the equality of man and woman in that, sto in that story of creation. And that's something that gets translated, gets brought down even into the code of canon law in 1983, uh, canon 1135 says that both parties have equal rights and duties as, as regards the, the marital society. And so that's written, that equality is written right into the laws of the church. And so uh, you have this equality of man and woman. The inequality comes as a result of sin. That that's the first time that it's mentioned that the man would be the superior of the woman as a result of the fall, or what we call the fall. Uh, so the inequality of man and woman only entered the world because of sin and not because of the way that God created things in the beginning. And so uh, you have this idea in the book of Genesis of the equality of husband and wife, the equality of man and woman. And then thirdly, you see that, it's, that this was not simply given, uh, the, the husband and wife, man and woman were not brought together simply for their own benefit, but for the good of the world so that the world becomes a holier place. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. It's not just about the two of you, it's about the two of you in service of the world. And this will go through, the, the, especially the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. This idea of married couples in service of the world. Now, sometimes the church emphasized more the, the procreative aspect of that, that they physically added to the world. But the whole idea behind that was that somehow the world becomes a holier place because of the presence of husband and wife. And so it adds to the holiness. And that, too, is written into the laws of the church. And so it was also for the marriage is also for the good of society. And so there's a societal dimension. And that's one of the more difficult things in the United States uh, to, to, to look at is that marriage has become very privatized. And so it's kind of hard to get couples to think about themselves as being of service to the world, declaring that through their, their union as husband and wife, that they become the servants of the world and that they, they bring God's holiness to the world. And so to ask them, well, you know, how is, how is the world going to be a holier place through you getting married? You know, that's just, they, don't, they haven't thought about that. You know? And so it's one of the things I ask couples to think about. How is the world going to be a holier place 
through your marriage. So that's, uh, that's what we find in, in uh, the book of Genesis and the stories of creation. Um, later on in the scriptures, the church started to reflect upon uh, marriage in terms of the pro prophets of Israel. Because again, in the prophets like uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, uh, Hosea, uh, very often the relationship between a husband and wife was seen as a symbol of the relationship between God and Israel. And so the, uh, the church began to reflect on it. Well, what does that mean? You know, if it's supposed to be reflective of the relationship between God and Israel, what, what does that mean? You know? And so this is where Augustine and, and, and people like him uh, expanded on this, this notion of marriage and said, that, uh, for example, that, well, because the relationship between God and Israel is a permanent relationship, you know, God never takes back the covenant, it's a permanent thing, therefore, if the relationship between husband and wife is to adequately reflect the relationship between God and Israel, it would have to be a permanent relationship. Marriage would be indissoluble because the covenant between God and Israel is indissoluble. Also, the relationship between God and Israel was a faithful relationship. God always remained faithful to that covenant and so if the relationship between husband and wife was to adequately reflect God's relationship to Israel, therefore the marriage relationship would also of its very nature have to be a faithful relationship. They also reflected upon the fact that that relationship between God and Israel was a fruitful relationship. It was one that was creative of life in the community. It was something that was passed on from generation to generation. And you see that in the stories of Israel of passing down from generation to generation, whether it's in the, the story of the Maccabees or whether it's the story of the Exodus. You, know, you tell these stories to the next generation. And so the relationship between God and Israel was a generative relationship. And so if the relationship between husband and wife was to adequately reflect the relationship between God and Israel, then the relationship between husband and wife would also have to be a fruitful relationship. And then finally, the, relation, the covenant relationship was a mutual thing. It was a two-sided thing. You, know, you will be my people and I will be your God. It was a two, it had terms on either side. And so if the relationship between a husband and wife was to adequately reflect the relationship between God and Israel, it would also have to be a mutual relationship. It would have to be one that flows back and forth. And so through the prophets, the, the theologians like Augustine and, and people in, uh, after Augustine reflected on that and came up with the idea that well, through the prophetic writings, we find like f these four characteristics of, of, of marriage, that it's permanent, that it's faithful, that it's fruitful, and that it's mutual. And so, it, because it is to be for the people a sign of God's faithful, fruitful, and abiding love. And so, uh, through the pro pro prophetic writings, you have some more reflection for the, uh, for the theologians. Then you get to the wisdom literature, and you have something like the Song of Songs, which really seemed to scare theologians, uh, because it was too sexy. <laughs> you know, and and that was, they, they, that, they, they couldn't think about why is this the revealed word of God, you know? Uh, they forgot to read Genesis. Uh, but they, they, they got worried about the, um, about the Song of Songs and so allegorized it to be, uh, it's really a song of the, the divine uh, nature of human love. And so they talked about the, the human love, again, being reflective 
of God's divine love. And so through the wisdom literature, you also have some fodder for the theologians reflecting on what the church, on what the church teaches about marriage. When you get to the Christian scriptures, uh, you find two principal uh, people that talk about marriage. Uh, one is Jesus, and the other one is Paul. And we tend to like Jesus and not like Paul. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but really, when, when people ask Jesus about, about marriage, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason, whatever? Uh, Jesus throws it back to, to Genesis. What do you read in the beginning? What do you read in your own law? And he said, well, Moses prevent, allowed for a, a writing of a bill of divorce. Moses permitted it. That was because of the hardness of your hearts. In the beginning, God created them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. Therefore, what God has joined may never be divided. And so Jesus really doesn't add anything new to marriage. He refers back to the stories of creation. You know, and so if you look at Matthew 19, and it's parallel passages in Mark 10 and Luke 16, you see Jesus' answer to, may a man divorce his wife for any reason, whatever. Now the problem comes when you get to Matthew 19 because it adds that little exception clause uh, that nobody knows what it, what it means, but he says that, uh, you know, that uh, you, can't, you can't divorce except for porneia. And nobody knows exactly what that word means. If you look it up into different translations of scripture, you see that it says, uh, except for infidelity, uh, except for an unlawful union. And so the people have tried to translate that, but exactly what porneia meant to the people of Jesus' time, or of Matthew's time, and in Matthew's community, uh, is a little bit of a mystery. So, uh, but we have Jesus simply referring back to the stories of Genesis. And then you have Paul, particularly in Ephesians 5, that we really don't like to read when it comes on uh, the Feast of the Holy Family, so we always use the shorter form, uh, <laughs> or we use the alternative reading. Uh, it, you have uh, Paul, when asked about it, after all of the stuff that he says, finally says, well, the whole thing is a mystery. I mean that it refers to Christ and the church. And so when Paul is asked about marriage, he refers back to that prophetic tradition that marriage is a symbol of the relationship between Christ and the church. And so you have Paul referring back to the prophetic tradition. And so there's not much added there. The other place that uh, was reflected in the church's understanding of marriage was the wedding feast at Cana, uh, which is sort of the foundational story of the, uh, for marriage. And, but except it wasn't for because, because Jesus went to a wedding. You know, Jesus went to a lot of different things in his life. We don't call all of them sacramental. You know, Jesus spent a considerable amount of time in fishing boats, but we don't consider fishing sacramental. Some of us may, but not, it's not universally accepted yet in the church. Uh, but, you know, uh, but the wedding feast at Cana was seen as the sort of foundational story for the, the sacrament of marriage because of what happened there. That what happened was, Jesus took something that was ordinary, the water that was used in Jewish ceremonial weddings, you know, for the Jewish ceremony. Jesus took what was ordinary, and in his presence, it became something extraordinary, wine, that then gave life to the community. And that's what marriage does. It takes what is ordinary, what was from the beginning, and for those who are in the Lord, for those who are baptized, that what is, which is ordinary becomes something extraordinary 
and it's given for the life of the community. And so that's why the wedding feast at Cana is the foundational story for the sacrament of baptism, not because of who Jesus was, but because of what happened there. And that's why it's the sacrament of baptism that is the foundation for the sacrament of marriage. Baptism requires that the followers of Jesus live out their married life in a different way. And that we see in the history of the church and marriage, which I'm going to get into now. Uh, that in the beginning, the church didn't have much to do about marri with marriage. Uh, it allowed people simply to marry however they did in society. And uh, because it wasn't the marriage that made, that made things different, it wasn't the wedding that made things different, it was the baptism of the person. The church was more concerned about how people lived out their marriage rather than about how they, they entered into it. And so the, the early Christian church it didn't have much to do with marriage. It simply allowed people to marry however they did in society. And for those who were in the Lord, those who were baptized, they lived that out in a different way than the rest of society did. And it was true. Christians were to live that life differently than the rest of the, than the, rest of the world. And so the church had no particular form for marriage uh, or celebration for marriage. There were occasional things in, in liturgical books of uh, blessings that would take place for marriage, uh, usually on the steps of the church, but there was, there was no sort of church marriage like we have, like we have today. Uh, the idea of a church marriage really didn't come into universal practice in the church for Catholics until 1908. And so it's a relatively recent uh, invention in the church. It was 1908 when finally it, the, the church said Catholics had to marry in a certain way in the church, and that that became part of the universal law in the church. What happened was that uh, people would marry, as I said, in however they did in society, and for those who were in the Lord, their marriage was special, their marriage was sacramental for the world. And that that's the way marriage developed. And that was fine in a Roman context, because you knew what marriage was, because Roman law said consent makes the marriage. And so you were fine. Consent makes the marriage, therefore, if somebody's given consent, therefore they're married, we recognize it. Well, as the church spread to the north in Europe, and as people migrated from the north to the south, uh, sometimes referred to as the invasion of the barbarians. Um, <laughs> you can either call it the migration of people or the invasion of the barbarians, as you wish. Um, the, the, the church began to experience different ways of marriage, people with different customs. And so from northern Europe, you had the emphasis was more on actions than on words. And so there were certain actions that meant that somebody was married. You know, the leading of the bride into the, in, in the, into the groom's house, the, uh, you know, other things that also take place that you see even today in, in other cultures, the, you know, uh, that indicate that these people are married. And so all of a sudden there's other rituals, other ceremonies that have to take place. And so consent doesn't quite make it. And so uh, the church had to rethink, what does it mean to be married? Uh, what is it that creates the marriage? And so you have this, this group coming down. You have the fall of Rome in the 400s. And that, too, changed the, the church's understanding of marriage and the way that the church looked at marriage. Up until then, you had uh, marriage being regulated by a civil society, 
and the church simply accepting that, then what happens when there is no civil society? What happens when the rules break down? You know? And so you get into that period, one of the periods that's referred to sometimes as the Dark Ages, although there's a number of different Dark Ages in, the, in history. We usually think, look of it as if it's only one, but there's a number of Dark Ages in, the, uh, in, in human history. Uh, and during those times, when there was nothing for certain in civil society, the church gradually began to take over what marriage was, what it meant to be married, simply because there was nobody else there to do it. And so gradually, over the course of, of several centuries, the church went from not having anything to do with marriage and simply allowing it to, to exist as it did in civil society, the pendulum swung and the church began to say, we have exclusive jurisdiction over marriage um, because there's nobody else there to say what it is. You know, so uh, you know, we're gonna set the ground rules on this. And also because people were coming to the church and asking, you know, am I married? And if so, to whom? And if so, why? And so the church was being asked questions about marriage. And so it started to reflect on, well, what does it mean to be married? You know, how do people get married? And what is it that they do when they get married? And so this was another historical evolution in the church. And so you go from the church accepting what is in civil society to the church taking over that task and defining what marriage is. And then you run into the French Revolution and the period of enlightenment, where the civil societies started taking back what they originally had in the beginning, which is jurisdiction over marriage. You know? um, and so as time went on, you know, starting with the French Revolution, you started to have more civil governments taking over the, the institution of marriage. Not without a struggle on the part of the church, but some of that was simply to get concessions from, from the civil government uh, that, that would be in favor of the church. But the, the church, uh, you know, gradually lost what it had taken over back in, the, you know, in, in these periods of the Dark Ages. And so uh, the pendulum has swung the other way now. Uh, so it's swung toward the church having exclusive jurisdiction, and now the civil society says, okay, we got organized here, so we can, we can take this back now. And the church doesn't quite like that. And so uh, wants to maintain that it has exclusive jurisdiction over marriage. And you have to say, well, what does that mean? You know, uh, you know, the Second Vatican Council said that the church has the right to say what is authentically human. And so the church has something to say about marriage as, you know, as, as what it is, as the symbol of, of God's relationship uh, with, with people. But, uh, you know, how far does that go? Well, the church really hasn't, hasn't come to grips with that yet. We're still, you know, uh, we're still in development as to what that means. But you can see that there's this gradual, this, this give and take, this back and forth between the church and civil society. And so uh, the other thing that we ran into was, of course, long prior to the French Revolution, was the Reformation. And that, too, had something to do with what the church said about marriage. Because the reformers said that the church shouldn't have anything to do about marriage. It's simply a civil reality. And so we should stay out of the business. And so as a reaction to that, the Council of Trent you know, in 1566 said, no, marriage is one of the seven sacraments, and it comes about 
by the consent of the parties that's witnessed by the church. And so as a result of that sort of historical development, uh, the, the church insisted that marriage was a sacrament and that the church had exclusive jurisdiction over it. And so again, it's this dialogue with history that goes on with the church's understanding of, of marriage. And so uh, that, was, that went on, you know, it, it also had something to do with the, the idea of consent. And so the, the Council of Trent said that the consent had to be given before a priest and two witnesses. And so that's where the idea of canonical form for marriage for Catholics took, you know, started out. Uh, however, it wasn't made part of universal law, as I said, until 1908. And so uh, it has a relatively short period of, uh, in, in the church. But then the question became, well, what is it that they're giving, con that two people give consent to? You know, once you decide how they do it, what is it that they're giving consent to? And this too had a long development, you know, part of which was uh, trying to explain how Mary and Joseph had a true marriage. You know, that was one of the main questions that theologians were, were, were grappling with in the, in the 1200s and the 1300s. Uh, how do we show that Mary and Joseph had a true marriage? And so again, this historical dialogue that took place. And so you have different people saying different things. You know, you have Peter Lombard saying, well, what you give consent to is the conjugal society. But then the question was, well, what is, what's a conjugal society? And so the church continued to study that. Uh, and then uh, finally, in the 14th century, end of the 13th, early 14th century, Duns Scotus, uh, the famous Franciscan, uh, and I'd like to invite all of you to the September 30th Duns Scotus lecture uh, here at CTU. Oh, just a little. <laughs> uh, uh, and we also have the uh, Duns Scotus chair, uh, Ed Foley, who's uh, the professor here at CTU. So Duns Scotus has a little bit to do with the uh, with, with CTU. Uh, Duns Scotus said, "Well, what?" What it is is that marriage is this contract. And the terms of the contract are that each party gives to the other the right to acts of sexual intercourse for the purpose of procreation. And that was that was became sort of the classic definition of marriage from the time of Duns Scotus who died in 1308, and so I assume he said this before he died. Um, you can't always tell in the history of the church. There, there were some things that were said long after the person died. But uh, uh, so sometime before 1308, uh, that, that became the, the, the classic definition of marriage, that it was a contract, the terms of which were the exchange of acts of sexual intercourse for the purpose of procreation. That stayed as the uh, official description of marriage up until the Second Vatican Council. And so from the late 1200s, early 1300s, until 1965 with Gaudium et Spes, which talked about marriage in a different way. So the Second Vatican Council in Gaudium et Spes 48 to 52 uh, talked about marriage as one of the things that the church in the modern world, you know, how do, we, how do we talk about marriage in the modern world? And what the, they did at Vatican II with, with that was they went back to the original descriptions of marriage in scripture and stopped talking about or didn't emphasize marriage as contract, but marriage as covenant. And so it re would reflect the relational aspect or the interpersonal relationship aspect of marriage. And so it went from talking, as Dun Scotus did, marriage is a contract, no, marriage is a covenant between two persons. 
And rather than exchanging the right to acts of sexual intercourse for the purpose of procreation, Gaudium et Spes said, it's an exchange of persons and not simply an exchange of rights. And so where the person gives their total self to the other and receives the total person in return. And so it became a far richer definition or description of marriage than what Duns Scotus had had of simply being uh, a matter of rights like any sort of civil contract. And so the Second Vatican Council gave flesh to the sacrament of marriage again, which, which it hadn't had uh, since, the, uh, since the traditional definition of it. The Catechism of the Council of Trent uh, talked about three things about marriage. It said it was for mutual help and assistance, for the good of offspring, and therefore the good of the faith, and remedy for sins of the flesh, uh, which were usually talked about as strictly male. It's to keep the boys in line. <laughs> And so uh, that, was, that was what the Council of Trent said. Now, later on, between 1566 and uh, the Vatican II, Gaudium et Spes, uh, the church also developed this idea that there was a hierarchy of ends, that the primary purpose of marriage was procreation, and that the secondary end was the mutual help and assistance that the, 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 the couple would give to each other. That all of a sudden disappeared in Gaudium et Spes. There's no longer any hierarchy of ends. Both of those things are equal. And so the, the, the purpose of marriage was no longer seen as primarily children, but it was children and the good of the, of, of the spouses. And so the good of the spouses was brought up to an equal footing. And so, again, the understanding of marriage changed after the Second Vatican Council so that um, you know, it became more reflective of the human person because Vatican II was very much involved with the human person, the human personality. And so uh, that sort of thing changed. And so, but marriage was still always seen as coming about through the consent of the parties. And that's where I just want to get a little bit, for just real briefly, into the idea of, uh, of marriage annulments or marriage tribunals. Uh, because in a tribunal, uh, what the church looks at is that moment of consent. That at the time that these two people exchange consent, did they have the necessary capacity for that consent? Did they have the necessary maturity? And did they have uh, the psych psychological well-being to make that sort of decision in their lives? Uh, did they have the necessary knowledge of the other party? And did they have the correct intention? Did they intend to do what the church says you do in marriage? which is to enter a relationship with, which is permanent, which is faithful, which is fruitful, and which is mutual. And so what the tribunal does is it takes a look at that consent. So it just sort of analyzes it to see uh, what actually were these people doing at the time of consent, at the time that they gave consent. And what the, what the church does, what a tribunal does at the end is not declare that nothing was there, because obviously something was there, but that what was there was not what the church means by marriage. It was something less than that. It didn't quite measure up to what the church teaches marriage has to be. And so, unfortunately, we use the term annulment for that, uh, which sounds like, you know, we're taking an eraser and wiping away this marriage. Uh, but that's not, what, that's not a particularly good description of what the church is doing 
in a tribunal because it's, it admits the reality of the relationship. So that relationship really was there. It was legally there. It was there you know, in over a number of years. So it doesn't attempt to wipe out a relationship, but instead takes a look at was that relationship what the church means by marriage? Or was it some other type of relationship which didn't quite measure up? And so that's what the church does when it taught, when in marriage tribunals. It's not doesn't deal with the fact of the relationship, but more with what went on in the relationship, the quality of the relationship. Did it have the qualities that are necessary for, uh, to establish Christian marriage? And so, um, you know, that, that whole tribunal stuff has evolved too. It's the pendulum swings from uh, being a very centralized uh, process, which it is right now and has been since 1741. Um, so, so relatively modern uh, in, as the church goes. Uh, <laughs> But over the years, it's been decentralized, and then it gets centralized, and then it gets decentralized. And so the pendulum swings back and forth in history. You know? So we don't know where that's going to go in the future either. Uh, the only thing that we do know is that all of this will be based firmly upon the word of God, on what God has revealed to us, and also in this dialogue with history that allows us to better understand what it is that is marriage and allows us to better celebrate that and then live that out in the context of the Christian community. So thank you. Thank you, Monsignor Lavis. We call him Pat here, so if he just came up <laughs> through my senior in front of all of you, but thank you for your rich presentation and the humor with which you delivered it as well. Um, we'll have some time here for questions. Nancy Nickel, our Director of Marketing, and I will be able to deliver you the microphone if you choose to ask a question of Lindsay in your life. It was, oh, I was hoping I wasn't that clear. <laughs> I like the way you stress the the good of society, and we really never hear that. At least I, I've been here a long time, and I can say it was really the procreation of children is all we heard, heard about. This was almost 50 years ago. But I would like you to um, give your feelings about about this, because we're talking about a lot of different cultures and. Um, a different, very different society from 1908 or whatever. Yeah, it's, uh, and also with, with different cultures, you know, uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that was debated at Vatican II was in talking about marriage uh, would, would be, is, you know, conjugal love an essential element <coughs> of marriage? And the, in getting, responses from other parts of the world, from the bishops in the other parts of the world, they said, well, that's not really an issue in our, in our culture. You know, I had a, a professor from India uh, who taught, uh, taught uh, the course in, in, uh, in marriage law, and he said, I don't understand Westerners. <laughs> he says, because you always want to fall in love and then marry. He says, where I come from, you marry, and then fall in love. And so to, to require love as an essential element of marriage would not be respectful of those cultures. You know? And so uh, there always has to be this dialogue and, and understanding too that the church is universal. And so before it, it makes a statement about something, it has to be sure that it's covering all of its cultural bases as well. And so. Uh, that's why things change and why sometimes, uh, you know, marriage gets described in different ways in different eras of the church. 
expanding more into the area of gay marriage when you talk about service to society. And that's, could you deal with that a little bit more? Uh, probably not in the time that I have. <laughs> <laughs> but again, remember that, that, you know, what I said you know, throughout the talk is that uh, the church's understanding of marriage has always taken place in dialogue. And it's never been, you know, uh, one specific moment. And so it's always in dialogue, and sometimes in dialogue with history. And I suspect that right now is another one of these uh, dialogical moments. Thank you. Thank you, Monsignor. Um, could you comment on how marriage becomes a, sa a sacrament, and in particular how that relates to grace? So in other words, do you, when you first get married, you get a great big injection of grace, and that's got to last you for the rest of your life, or are there two nuts? I think that's <laughs> good question. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a theologian, I'm a canonist, so uh, grace is not my specialty. <laughs> uh, we've never been considered the most graceful part of the church. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think our understanding of sacrament has changed that it isn't, uh, you know, you get this whole shot at the beginning and then sort of, you know, it sort of wears off after a while. It's not like, uh, and this is dating myself, uh, but, you know, it's not like winding a watch and then letting it run down, you know, that there is this sort of, uh, continual infusion of God's grace uh, all the way along the line. And, you know, um, I've had married couples talk about that. Uh, the, the, the last person who talked about it to me was, uh, he talked about it in terms of his wedding ring. I guess it was... Left. Left. Okay, <laughs> never worn one. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that he said, this is my wife always with me. He said, because at our wedding, she gave me my ring and said, take this ring as a sign of my love and fidelity. So this is her always with me. And he said, a lot of times, he said, especially when I've been away, you know, on business and doing things, the sight of that wedding ring just reminds me of this person who is always with me. And that's, that's sort of the infusion of God's grace at that moment. And so it's something that, that continues. Yeah. Uh, as a student of history, with the modest one at that, my senior, that you break our curiosity by uh, alluding to 1908. What was the, uh, I mean, the period of maybe 75, maybe the First World War, 19 stuff going on there, but what were the influences on the Vatican that it felt necessary to, to make this startling, uh, what must have been a, a pronunciamento in regard to this? Yeah, well, what had happened was, so after the, after Trent, there was uh, a decree that said that Catholics had to marry before a priest and two witnesses. However, it was only in effect in those places where it was published. Uh, because in some places it couldn't be published because those were the Protestant places, and so it would be a danger to Catholics to have to marry before a priest and two witnesses. So if it couldn't be published in a certain place, uh, then the people there, the Catholics there, weren't bound. Uh, so by 1908, uh, they figured that it might be safe now to publish this to the whole church. And so in the, uh, initially the church had, uh, after Trent had issued a, uh, a decree called Tom Etsy uh, that had this in, uh, because of the concerns that people had, uh, in 1908 they issued a decree called May Tamere, or don't worry. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, uh, that uh, if you didn't get married by a priest, here's how we're gonna fix it up. 
And so that was the, 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 the decree in 1908. And it simply was that it was safer by 1908 uh, for Catholics to marry anywhere. But so that's how it came about. about the, what I've been reading uh, in the cardinal statements about same sex marriage and how it's explained so that I understand it. Uh, I guess we understand it. Okay, I'm not always able to explain the cardinal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you get across purposes. But, um, so <laughs> I, I hear and he knows that. <laughs> discussions, uh, two discussions about uh, marriage from all more of a historical Yeah, I think, again, the church has always been very careful when it's dealing with marriage to realize that marriage is a, an institution beyond the church that existed before the church, you know? And so uh, the church generally in its laws uh, tries to make it as easy as possible for people to enter into marriage. And so, you know, it's like uh, the church says, we don't want to fool with mother nature, you know? Uh, what was part of the human condition uh, from the beginning, uh, we don't want to tamper with that any more than we have to. And so the church takes a very minimalist approach to what's necessary for marriage. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of the pronouncements are things that go back to these, this idea that marriage is this human reality. There was a, a book out, uh, before the Second Vatican Council, but it's still an excellent study uh, by uh, Edward Skillevex on marriage, human reality, and saving mystery. And uh, it really described this interaction between this human reality of marriage and what, uh, what the, the sacred reality of. Uh, it was republished a few years ago by Sheen Ward, uh, but it's uh, it's still, you know, uh, uh, an excellent source. Here, one last question. In 1908, you said the form was set that it would be before a priest and supervision. Right. Was there anything said about it, be, it can't be in the church or it can't be, it has to be in the rectory or that, you know, any of that nonsense? <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> Well, it, you know, it was, you know, usually in the parish. And so, for example, um, my parents had to get married in the rectory of St. Rita Parish because my dad was Greek Orthodox. And so they were not allowed to marry in the church. Uh, that's 1935. St. <coughs> Rita's Parish, they said that? Yeah. But the parish next door might say something different. They shouldn't. They should. It should be, you know, <laughs> universal. Usually, if, what, if it was a non I mean, Catholic marrying non Catholic, it couldn't be in the sanctuary. Uh, you know, it had to be in front of the communion rail. Uh, you know, and so you may remember some of those things. Uh, the basic fact of where the church, where the people get married, uh, is that uh, they marry where the church gathers. And so, because it is a statement by the couple of their relationship to the community that we're going to be for you a sign of the faithful, fruitful, and abiding love of God. Therefore, uh, you should stand before the community and not out on Promontory Point, you know? Because uh, how's anybody gonna know that that's, you know, what you're doing out there, you know? And so you do it where the church gathers. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you. sure uh, Monsignor Lagos will be an hour